Hey everybody, my name is Ted Forbes. Welcome back to another episode of The Art of Photography. Uh, a couple things this week. If you haven't checked out our new website, please do. Uh, that is, the URL on that is theartofphotography.tv. And I usually keep show notes on the episode, so sometimes it's good to visit there. So if you're watching on YouTube or something like that, there should be a little link below so you can, uh, you can check that out. Um, also, as I mentioned in the last episode, uh, we're working on putting together the advisory committee for the summer. And actually, it won't be just for the summer. We're just doing it this summer. Uh, so if you'd like to be on the advisory board, Board and have some say in what we cover in the show and podcast ideas and some of our project ideas and things like that. Love to have you on board. I've got a lot of good responses so far. Um, everybody will make it on to kind of a standing steering, steering committee, uh, but I'm going to pick nine people actually to be kind of the first advisory committee. And we're going to meet via Google Plus probably once every three or four months and kind of have our meetings that way. So if you're interested, go to the website and check that out. Uh, if you go on to the art of photography TV under the about section, you'll see a little link for advisory committee. So, and I'll put a link in the show notes below. Um, so anyway, uh, last time we had talked about shooting raw images and what the benefits are to shooting in raw, why you would want to do it when it's appropriate, when it may not be so appropriate. And I thought it, be a, it might be a good follow up to, uh, in this episode, go over to the computer and we're actually going to look at some examples of bringing in raw images and some JPEGs and see what the differences are. So I'll give you a little real world example there. So come on over and let's have a look. All right, so we have a set of images here um, that I've got uh, that are thrown into a folder. And uh, what I want to do is show you um, some kind of, well, uh, some examples of, you know, using Camera Raw and why I would use Camera Raw to have some more control. Some of these have some unconventional uh, lighting things going on and, um, you know, that type of thing. Um, but anyway, either way, if you look, I have um, basically six images in this folder. And these are called .cr2 files, which is the Camera Raw format that Canon uses. And these were all taken on a 5D. Uh, in camera raw um, format. And basically what happens is if I go into bridge and I double click on any of these images, it's going to open them before it will bring it into Photoshop. It brings it into the Camera Raw converter, and this is Camera Raw 6.7. Uh, one thing I do want to note is that I know, um, you know, Adobe Creative Suite or Photoshop CS6 is out. Uh, I'm doing CS5 in all of these examples simply because I have not upgraded. I have not had time to do so yet. Uh, and you know, sometimes with upgrading comes headache. But anyway, the, the the basic principles. There's there's some new features in CS6, but basic principles of what I'm showing you are are all fine and just just fine. Five. If you look at the bottom of the window that brings open, this is kind of the conduit window. So this allows us to do some changes uh, to our camera raw file before we open it up into Photoshop. And if I look down here at the bottom, if I click on this, it allows me to change these parameters. And it's pretty important to have these set correctly for your workflow options. Um, you know, obviously, uh, higher depth uh, is going to create a bigger file, but it is possible to do, and it's why you would want to do it. This is basically what it's going to bring into when it turns this into a Photoshop file from a camera raw file. And if I click on the drop down menu for space, uh, you can see that there's Adobe RGB 1998, Color Match RGB. I have a couple options in here. I'm going to leave this set to Art Adobe RGB 1998. Of these, I feel the most comfortable with, and it is the widest color space. Uh, sRGB is a monitor uh, kind of standard that was developed a few years ago and it is much narrower. In other words, there's just not the same color spectrum that you have um, in something like 1998. So I will leave this set at Adobe RGB 1998. For depth, I may bring this up to 16 bits per channel. This is going to give me a much higher depth and it'll allow me a little more leeway, especially if I need to brighten shadows, which is what we're actually going to do in some of these. Um, so anyway, those are the main two settings. Uh, resolution, I'm not real concerned about because I tend to change that depending on the output uh, later. And it just as long as you have full resolution in there, you're fine. So 240 pixels an inch is OK. Um, you know, it's the number of pixels, not how many of them are defined in an inch at this point. So anyway, we'll go ahead and say OK. And those will be our settings as we bring this in. Now, uh, going back to the camera raw window here, you have a preview on the left hand side. And then there's going to be a series of palettes over here on the right hand side that are going to allow you to make changes to this image. And what I generally try to do is not get it exact. Um, this is assuming we're going to open it into Photoshop and do some more work on it possibly. Um, so I try to get it workable and uh, kind of bear with me and I'll show you what that means as we go. Um, I can zoom in to parts of this image and we will look at, at some of those examples in a minute because sometimes you want to look at details. Um, but first thing you have is your white balance. And I have a little drop down menu if you want a little quick setting here. And remember we talked about last episode that camera raw does not set in stone the white balance, which is really nice. Uh, it will give a setting in here, which is as shot, but I can change this to automatic and you can see it just makes it a little more blue, which actually isn't too bad. Uh, if I change this to something like daylight, you're going to see that it goes pretty, um, 
kind of orangish, which kind of gives a neat look. This was an overcast sky when I shot this, so the, it, it has some interest to it. Uh, but you can kind of play around with this. This might be the kind of shot where you don't have to have it color corrected exactly. Uh, generally, fluorescent is going to probably be the closest match. These are probably sodium lights on the ground here, and so it's going to be in, in the color... Um, the uh, color temperature of these lights on the ground were probably much different than the spotlights on the dome here. And so that creates kind of another layer. So, you know, this is, I might have to work more with this in Photoshop. Or you can go in here and manually change these sliders around until you get something that kind of works. It's a little too green. Uh, basically, the two continuums you have are you can, you know, the first slider makes it more blue or more yellow. Second slider is on the continuum of green to magenta. And that will help set your white balance. Um, you know, so if you have a shot that's super critical, sometimes it helps to have actual white in the image that you can adjust that too. Um, the next stuff is pretty intuitive and I generally will leave the exposure as set because I try, I, I generally will get this close in the camera, but if you need to come up an exposure a little bit and make that brighter, you certainly can or if I need to darken it, if I want it to be real moody I can certainly do something like bring that down and maybe bring the brightness up for some of those highlights, uh, bring the contrast up a little bit. Anyway, so you can start to play with your image. Um, the the next two options under, ex, under exposure are pretty important. There's recovery and fill light. And basically what happens happens and I'll show you an example here in another image. Uh, let's close this out and I'll go ahead and show it to you. This is one that I bracketed and I had three different exposures for and so you can see, let me open all three of these here so you can uh, see them side by side, but I was having some trouble uh, basically because this is some extreme contrast. These were taken uh, at Laycock Abbey in uh, the UK and this was actually uh, the building that Fox Talbot owned and did some of the first photography experimentations in and so it was a neat place to be and I, I, I liked the look of this doorway and so I was trying to shoot it. Well the challenge here is it was dark inside the building where I was and it was very bright outside and so it was really hard as you can see this one on the lower right hand side where I got some detail in here inside the room but I completely the highlights outdoors. This one I underexposed and had, you know, better exposure outside, but I lost a lot of the information in there. And so it's up to you what you want to try to do with something like this. I did not have a tripod, and so this will not really work as an HDR shot. I might be able to get it to work, but for our purposes here, what I want to do is open this up and show you. Um, what happens is we were looking at exposure a second ago, and I can bring that down, of course, and probably get a little bit back. And you can see that some of our blown highlights that were gone to white come back into play here. Let's go back and set the exposure to zero. The next one down is recovery, and recovery basically is recovering blown highlights. And you can see as I move that all the way over to 100, it did recover some of the detail in there, but not enough. I mean, it's still pretty, uh, it looks like it's foggy out there because the contrast is just kind of strange. So that's one I would probably bring into Photoshop and burn and dodge a little bit, and it might give me some trouble. Um, what I have noticed, it's if you have to sacrifice highlights or shadows, and this is just my experience, but with Camera Raw, I would rather sacrifice sacrifice the shadows. For some reason, those seem to be easier to bring back detail in, uh, even at kind of a level where it's just kind of whispering at you. Um, it's really hard for me to bring highlights back, and I'm real funny about that because I, I, you know, I'm just, for whatever reason, I'm not crazy about blown highlights. So let's cancel that one out, and let's go back into the darkest of the images, and I'll open this one up. Same image. This is a bracketed exposure. This was probably underexposed in at least two stops. And you can see that the detail in the yard out here, the outdoor portion of this, is a better exposure. I might still bring the recovery in just a little bit on that and play with that, but uh, but but basically that's what it is. Um, the next one down is fill light, and fill light is the opposite of recovery. Rather than bring back detail in the highlights, this will bring back detail in your shadows. So you can see as I turn this up, I can actually brighten up the interior. That is really bright, and you'll notice the higher you bring the switch up, the more noise you're going to get in the picture. But since we are doing camera raw and we're bringing this into 16-bit color space, um, this should do pretty well. And for this image, I'll be honest, it, it is an extreme of outdoor to indoor, so I do want to bring the highlights, or excuse me, the shadow detail back in a little bit. But you can see I have much more play. I mean, this looks dark over here, and I'm able to bring back quite a bit of detail with the fill light slider, whereas recovery, I just don't have as much room with. So if you have to sacrifice one or the other, I would rather expose for the highlights and then bring it in here and process for the shadows so that's what you're basically doing um, and so I might bring it somewhere around here which which feels good to me um, you can also bring up some of your blacks and you can kind of crush them a little bit which is kind of popular thing uh, so they have more contrast kind of in the shadow areas and then of course brightness brings up 
the image and brightens it a little bit too. And you can see that you start to add contrast by doing these things. You'll also notice that my white balance has shifted on me a little bit too. And this is going to be a hard one to deal with because you're dealing with an outdoor and then shade. So you're probably going to have to mess around with this a little bit once we get it into Photoshop. So I'll probably just try to get it the best I can right here. So we don't spend all day on one image here. I'll show you some other things that you can do here. Typically, uh, the next... Um, panel over is the tone curve and I can literally go in here and adjust it does it has a similar effect but you probably get a little more control over your highlights bring them down a little bit here's just regular lights Actually, that looks pretty good so between the two of those I can bring that outdoor area down to something that's usable uh, and you can also bring out your darks your shadows and you can see that really what it's doing is creating a curve here get that to kind of where you want it um, bring that back just a little bit more make it a little brighter Go over to the next panel. This is the sharpening panel. And this is going to change depending on, uh, and you can do a little noise reduction here too, but we're going to talk about sharpening for a second. And this is kind of a whole lesson on sharpening. But just to let you know right here, these sliders, much like the unsharp mask, will change depending on the resolution of your camera. So for instance, if you have something that's a 25 mega, mega pixel camera, um, it's going to be a bigger image, obviously, than a six megapixel camera. And so in that case, the amount and radius change. For the 5D, I would like to re leave my radius set around 1.4 or so, and the amount, I can bring this up to about 70 or 80 before it starts getting kind of really strange, so I'll leave that around 72. And of course, you probably want to use your magnifying glass and come in to preview the sharpening, and you can see that it's starting to add a little noise, so I can reduce some of that as well. Uh, so you, you know, add to taste and, uh, and play with that some. I'll bring back here and fit the image in the view. And the other ones that are really important here, uh, you know, split toning is really nice if you have uh, two white balances going on, one for the highlights or one for the shadows. So that's a very handy thing to have. Um, I'm going to skip that for this image here. But this one's really important too, which is lens corrections. And particularly, uh, the 5D is a full frame camera. And some of the smaller frame cameras, especially with wide angle lenses, you're going to get a lot of distortions. Well, what's really nice is Photoshop keeps kind of a library of lens profiles in here. And so when I enable this, you're going to know that it knows that it did two things. And I'm going to toggle this. I'm going to show you what to look for. One, it dealt with a little bit of the pin cushion that was, or excuse me, some of the uh, barrel distortion that was going on with the lens. So you're going to see that even out a little bit. And you can manually correct that even more if you need to. And the other thing it's going to do is it notes the f-stop that you used on the uh, image. In this case, it was 3.2. And it noticed that it had some vignetting. So that means the edges basically are a little bit dark with that particular aperture setting. So what it's going to do is compensate for both of them. So when I say enable, and watch when I click this, You'll see the edges go a little bit lighter, and you'll see the uh, the barrel distortion clip out just a little bit. And it did a pretty good job of that. Okay, now here's the deal. Sometimes vignetting is not necessarily a bad thing, and I do want it in my image. So you may or may decide to correct this or not. You can also add vignetting back in if you want to do so later on. So anyway, these are the basic things that I'm going to be looking for with an image as I deal with it. And then when you're ready, you just go ahead and say open image, and it will take just a second to render this camera raw file. And there it is. Voila. We are in Photoshop right now. We can do further editing, and we are at 16-bit. And if I zoom way in on this, you'll notice there is a little noise in here, but it it did a pretty good job, all things considering, if you look at the detail in here, brightening up those shadows. Uh, you have much more leeway than you do with with uh, with blown highlights. So if you have to make a choice when you're when you're making an image out in the field, I definitely um, keep your your highlights under control, and uh, you can bring up shadows if you need to. The other thing I'll show you too, and not that this is the best example for this, um, but uh, well, here's here's an idea. Okay, so like on this one. I'm going to zoom in here. This is an outdoor scene in London, and this is really inward tent. But you can see that some of these signs here are blowing out just a little bit. The, the exposure was just a little bright. So what I might want to do is drop my exposure down. In this case, you can see that the typography gets the letters get get tighter. Bring my recovery in just a little bit. Now let's go back out to this image. Let's say fit in view. And now what I'll do is I will use my fill light after I've made that adjustment to bring back some of those shadow areas. And that way I've toned down the highlights and I've brought up the shadows. Again, this is possible to do with a JPEG, but if you're shooting in JPEG mode, but just get your, your chances of these shadow areas getting really noisy, you just don't have as much data to play with in the image. You can make these adjustments, but you're gonna start getting some ugliness going on with, with uh, grain and digital uh, noise and stuff like that. Uh, and then obviously the, the color temperature you can shift over to. Um, it is not set in stone, and so I don't lose any detail when I move that about. And you're probably going to have to do this one to taste because, again, I think we have several different types of light going on in this image. But I can get it close. And, again, I would go through, I would do that, get it 
you know, in the ballpark. I'd go through here and probably mess with my sharpening a little bit. I'll bring this up to 70 or so, and let's bring this up to 1.4. Uh, you know that'll change again depending on the resolution of your camera. Any kind of split toning you need to do, uh, you can do so. This looks a little green. Let's go back to this and bring in the magenta just a little bit. There we go. And then we'll go back over to the lens. Uh, go ahead and enable the correction on that. Which again, I kind of like some of the vignetting, so I may go back and add that later because I, I would like to have that distortion corrected. And you know, you can also go back through here and put the mini editing back in if you so desire or if it's not enough you can bring it out so but anyway that's more or less how we were bringing in camera or images from camera raw into photoshop one last thing i want to show you actually see that looks pretty good let's go ahead and zoom in yeah we got a lot of nice sharp detail in there and you can see back you can read all these signs which is you know they're not perfect but uh it's not bad considering it was pretty dark when i shot this uh one last thing i want to show you that's going on here and this is pretty cool too is let's go ahead and i'm going to uh, show you the desktop here okay here's my folder this is the actual folder on the computer and you can see that i have my cr2 files in here which are the camera raw files i also have you can see that it made for those two images that i opened this xmp file and this is pretty cool uh, you can see it's only seven kilobytes it's really small but what this is is they call these an xmp sidecar file and what adobe bridge and photoshop have done is they've taken all the changes that you've made when we opened it up in that camera raw conduit application you know so right before it comes into photoshop so take took all those adjustments that we made with the levels and with the um, uh, highlights and, and you know bringing all that back and it put it in its own little XML file basically and so this is completely non-destructive editing it didn't touch the camera raw file um, it left them as it, as they were and so what's really nice is if you get really straight off from, you know you want to revert it back to the original you can just chuck the XML file and it's done but it also keeps all the editing non-destructive so you can reset all your settings which is pretty nice so anyway that's basically how we bring camera raw images in and uh, I would definitely suggest try some try some work with it and maybe do some experiments where you shoot both camera raw and JPEG and play with it and uh, you know bring them in and, and see what you think. Okay, so I hope that gives you some insight on uh, shooting raw and uh, actually bringing them into the computer and being able to manipulate them like that. Um, and remember, like I said last time, there's some there's some advantages to shooting raw, and those main advantages are you know things like your white balance isn't set in stone, your contrast, color saturation. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility with those. Uh, sometimes, if you're trying to in post production pull some more shadows uh, or some more detail out of shadow areas, that helps to have raw format to do that because you have more data. It's pretty much getting exactly what the sensor or saw uh, as you bring it in. It's not always a complete lifesaver in an extreme situation, but it does give you a little more flexibility in doing that. Uh, this does come with a trade-off, and we did talk about that last time, and that trade-off is, is there's more work required when shooting raw images, and for certain things, and I think the majority of my work, it is worth that trade-off to do. Uh, but also, you know, you kind of have to figure out what that trade-off is for you. Uh, if you want to just shoot in JPEG, that's probably a more sensible idea if you're shooting event-based photography or you're shooting particularly family stuff, uh, snapshot-oriented things. But if you're the kind of photographer who does do events, uh, sporting events, weddings, uh, you know, anything like that, I think it's important to, to still consider JPEG as an option. It's not a... a um, it's not that it's it's uh, subordinate to raw necessarily. It's just you don't get uh, you know some of those things we talked about, some of those trade-offs. Uh, sometimes if you have to go in and really change exposure, or bring things out of shadows or highlights, you're 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 going to be more limited in a JPEG format. However, it's still perfectly valid to shoot those uh, when when the need arises. So anyway, it's totally up to you. It's up to your workflow, what works best for you. Um, you know how much patience and energy you have for that type of thing, and generally how good you are with shooting images. Uh, you know most of us strive to get. To to a level where post-production we minimize because it's just easier to get it, as much of it as possible in the camera beforehand. I know there's certain circumstances where post-production is important, but anyway, all that to say, um, that's more or less shooting raw images and bringing the computer. I hope you found this useful, and we'll see you next week. Thanks again for watching The Art of Photography. Done.